a welcome to everyone joining us on today's CEPI webinar. Um, I will give people a few minutes to join us. I see you all piling in now. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, if you want to let us know in the chat, where are you tuning in from? We'd love to see where you're all joining us from today. Okay, we have Germany represented. All right. Massachusetts, Ireland. Wow. All right. India. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Depending on what time it is there. All right, Canada. And we'll give people one more minute to continue joining us and we'll get started. Oh, wow. All right. Well, you guys have some global representation today. Clearly. That's the beauty yeah. of these things, right? The <laughs> opportunity to that's great across the globe, as it were. We already have a question. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Well, welcome all. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us. This is CEPI's uh, free webinar series. This is an ongoing series. So we already have our next webinar scheduled. That is for Wednesday, June 16th. I will send a link for that webinar out in the chat for you all to check it out. Um, so today we have a really um, full agenda. So I will be passing the mic on here quickly. We will be um, having a webinar on advancing psychotherapy integration by creating common ground. And we have a great set of presenters for you all today. So in terms of Q&A, uh, if you have any questions coming up, feel, feel free to send those to me in the Q&A box. If you have a technical issue or concern, you may use the chat for that. Um, so we will be saving questions until there's a, a break in the discussion. At that point, I will hop in with your questions. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to our presenters. So welcome right. once again, and thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, this is I'm very excited about today uh, and uh, the opportunity to share the screen with uh, some icons and visionaries and good friends. Uh, so thank you guys for, for taking the time. Uh, Greg Henriquez, uh, I am uh, a professor of graduate psychology uh, and a core faculty member in the Combined Integrated Doctoral Program. I'm also happy to be uh, president-elect of CEPI. Uh, and I really look forward to today's con conversation. And maybe I'll pass it over to Marv uh, and you can uh, introduce yourself, although I'm sure you don't need much of an introduction here, Marv. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Greg. Marv Goldfried. I'm at uh, Stony Brook University and been interested in integration for oh, about 40 some odd years, and they have been somewhat odd, and um, co-founded CEPI together with Paul Wachtel and a bunch of other people and have thought about the topic, and I'll hopefully share some of these thoughts today. Wonderful. Uh, Jeffrey? Uh, yes, um, thanks, thanks for uh, inviting me, and um, I'm at New York Medical College, uh, but I'm really a, a psychotherapy trainer and, um, and clinical therapist, and, um, and interested in psychotherapy integration since my residency days, but especially since I joined CEPI in 2004. And also, uh, as, as you know, the founder of the um, of the special interest group within CEPI on convergence. Right, exactly. So we have, we have good people here to dialogue about consensus and the direction of psychotherapy integration. And to lead us, uh, Mike. Hi all, my name is Mike Moscolo. I'm from Merrimack College in uh, Massachusetts. I'm a developmental psychologist. My work uh, focuses on developing a broad and comprehensive uh, theoretical and empirical approach to studying anything that develops, a, a global model of development. And um, I'm interested in thinking about psychotherapy as a developmental process. The idea that when 
uh, psychotherapy it works it works by fostering development psychological social development within individuals and their relationships i'm happy to be here great okay so um what i'd like to do is share you a little bit about what we have in store for today um and uh and that's going to start with this concept of creating common ground uh at least a brief overview this is a a, a process a reflective process a conflict uh, resolution process, a way of bringing people together that Mike Muscolo developed. Uh, he introduced it to me and I fell in love with it. Um, and I uh, participated some in some, some particular kinds of uh, group exercises that he developed. Uh, so what I'd like us to do first is Mike and I will share a little bit about what creating common ground is, how it works, uh, just give you an overview. Um, it, it's very much about understanding people in different positions, how they might get locked into positions, okay, uh, and then how that you know may prevent us from seeing opportunities for growth and synergies uh, and whatnot. Um, I believe that the field of psychotherapy integration uh, was a beautiful advance. Uh, I'll even make a comment in my own little narrative about that, uh, and that Mark Goldfried and Paul Wachtel and other visionaries saw an opportunity uh, for us to create some common ground uh, with CEPI and did it in a great job, uh, and then. Uh, what that, but what I'm also seeing is an opportunity maybe to advance the ball here as we enter the uh, 2020s, uh, this decade. Uh, and I think this common ground process can do that. So Mike and I will talk briefly about that. Then each of us will dialogue for about 10 minutes uh, talking about our positions. Uh, and then we'll hand it over to Mike. He'll give us a richer articulation of common ground. And then we will engage in a dialogue uh, to see what emerges out of that. We have no idea. This is an, uh, this is an experiment. Uh, you know, maybe we'll all you know, sign off and run away. You know, we'll see what happens in relation. Um, but, uh, and then we'll see what unfolds and then we'll start, start that process. This was actually the seed for this, uh, Alberta Cost and I, uh, in terms of my role as uh, uh, president-elect, was like, hey, we should do a panel discussion um, uh, for the conference, the CEPI conference in June. Uh, this, by the way, is part one of that conference. Uh, so we're really trying to lay the groundwork and then we're going to create uh, a dialogue uh, for that. So that's the overview of what we're looking at. Uh, Mike, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, more about Common Ground just to lay uh, the groundwork before we get in uh, sure. to giving our positions? Yep, sounds good. Yeah, the, uh, the, the program is called Creating Common Ground. And um, it... Uh, I have long uh, been frustrated, like many people, with the uh, with the cacophony of voices in psychology, and uh, a desire to seek integration of the various voices into a more comprehensive and unified system. Uh, the impetus for creating common ground uh, came in part from that, but also came, well, sadly, from the 2016 United States American <laughs> election, in which uh, there was massive, as you know, massive political polarization, and uh, it motivated a lot of people. To, uh, uh, to, to, to move in, in ways that they never thought before, including me. And I became very, very interested in the question of how to bridge political divides, uh, uh, how to actually get people who hate each other's positions uh, to talk to each other and maybe synthesize novel positions that they can share. And so that's where this came from. It came from both the, uh, the theoretical uh, uh, perspective in psychology and from a political perspective. and. Um, and it is applicable, we hope, to uh, seeking to integrate uh, theoretical positions and theoretical positions, uh, perspectives in, uh, in psychotherapy and psychology. Sweet, excellent. Uh, and therefore that provides the basic structure. Uh, so I think what we can then represent uh, in terms of Marv, Jeffrey and myself is sort of three different paths and angles around psychotherapy integration. Uh, we'll dump those puzzle pieces out, and then we'll see what emerges if we uh, sort of run them through the lens of creating common ground. Uh, so what I'd like to do then is invite Marv uh, Goldfried to share uh, his screen and to take us through kind of what he sees, what his position is, and we've asked folks to have, you know, a 10-minute narrative uh, for each of us to uh, share that perspective. Uh, I just messed up. Okay. Not things to come. You'll get it back. Um, how yeah, do I get back? That's fine. Um, so we are seeing your screen right now. It's on Zoom. So we're basically, uh, if you know how to go to, get, yeah, that's the right thing. You got it. You did it. Is. 
You did it. Perfect. Okay. Very good. Roll. All right. So let me uh, try to give you a very brief uh, overview. Um, if you want to put it on slideshow or not, I'm trying to, to, but oh, my to the, slide, the now there it is. You did it. I've got to move that a little bit. Let's see. This is not the way we rehearsed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not a good start. Um, There's a little. Uh, I, I, I have a task bar on the book. Oh, there it is. I'm just going to move it. Nope. Slideshow. I slide click on. Yeah. All the way to the there. There it is. There, there, there it is. OK. You did it. Hooray. OK, in conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to take the next uh, 10 minutes to give you an overview. There's a lot here. Um, we should mention that our slides will become available. Uh, and Lauren will tell you how. Um, and maybe some of this can be woven into the discussion. But basically, here's, here's my, my thesis. Um, the question that I've come to consider is on what can we agree? So rather than having different types of integration, uh, I'm going to be very, very pragmatic. What can we, as both clinicians and researchers, agree is involved in psychotherapy ch change, regardless of orientation. So let me start very briefly about the stages of change. Patients come in, they're not quite sure why their life is not working, but it's not working because they have interpersonal conflict, because they have various symptoms, um, because they're not, being, they're not functioning well, they know that it's not working, but they don't know why. And we can say that this is a lack of awareness of why they are not effective or competent. So what the therapist then begins to do is to help the individual become aware of some of the, quote, dynamics, factors, determinants, variables uh, from both past and present that seem to have brought them to the point where they are now, where their life is not working. We can call this case conceptualization, or we can say that they now become aware of the factors that are causing them not to function as well, a state of conscious incompetence. And it may be because um, the way they ask for something from another person um, may prevent them from getting what I want. They want. So they could say to their significant other, you know, you're, damn, you're so damn selfish. You never give me what I want without being aware that the way that they are responding is destined to prevent them from getting what they want. So they become aware of their incompetence. Um, we can call it insight. We can call it metacognition. We can call it observing ego. We can call it decentering and different orientations have different labels for the ability of the person to step back and reflect. So now that I know, what am I supposed to do? Well, maybe there's a different way you need to interact with your partner, you know, and, and the therapy then focuses not so much on awareness, but on doing something differently. And the person may be, uh, the patient may be skeptical, but if the bond, the therapeutic bond is good, and if they have a good contract, uh, it increases the likelihood they'll try to go out and do something. And my goodness, um, with deliberate effort, it may work. So they have this conscious competence. The therapy obviously does not end then. There needs to be a working through and a generalization or however you want to label it so that this continues to occur over time and the more it occurs over time, um, the more automatic it becomes. So the question then becomes, can we, of different theoretical orientations, agree in this general way that this is what occurs? Much more occurs, and the details are, are not specified. But strategically, I, what I want to do is to find out step by step 
on what can we agree. And then when we start disagreeing, then it becomes a question of why and how we can untangle this. <clears throat> so one of the things that I've written about over the years uh, has to do with a point where agreement is more likely. So here we can have a picture of different levels of abstraction regarding therapy. So we have our theoretical orientations at the, very, the highest level of abstraction, tied in maybe with philosophical uh, assumptions as well. And for simplicity purpose, you can say it's psychodynamic experience, experiential, behavioral, or cognitive behavioral, recognizing that within each, there are certainly many different forms of, of, uh, of intervention. So that's the highest level. The lowest level is the technique, the procedure. Um, some people interpret, some people reflect, some people have patients self-monitor. So the techniques can vary. But at this middle level of abstraction, we, have, we have, can have a principle. What is the principle? To help increase awareness, to help the person go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. There's increasing awareness. Um, so what are possible therapeutic change principles at this middle level of, ab uh, of abstraction? And basically what I've done is I've gone through a lot of the literature uh, and pulled out common themes, at least what seem to be common themes. One is the expectation and that the motivation that some sort of change or growth is possible and will be helpful. Um, if it doesn't exist, some steps need to be taken to improve these expectations and motivation. And we now have trans theoretical models that can help people increase their positive expectations and increase their motivation to change, regardless of the school of therapy. Another principle, the presence of an optimal therapeutic alliance. As I tell my graduate students, the goal of session one is session two. You've got to create a bond where the patient trusts you, where you have respect for each other, where you're willing to work collaboratively. You've got to agree on what the goals of therapy are, and you have to be on the same page with regard to uh, the methods. There's lots and lots of research to indicate that when this is present, there's a greater likelihood of change, again, regardless of orientation. The third principle is to help the person become better aware. And this is the example that I gave before in talking about levels of abstraction. Um, they need to become better aware of themselves and their world, interpersonal or otherwise. Um, and the and when we get into some detail, the question is, what, what does that really mean when we unpack it? And I'm not going to do that now because I don't want to, I, I want to leave time for everybody else to give their uh, initial uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but the details are really important in, in fully understanding what this means. Encouraging corrective experiences. The original notion of Alexander in French, which basically is taking the risk and trying to do things differently, trying to think differently, trying to act differently, um, based on the fact that you have become better aware that what you're doing is not working. And we can get, I do have quotes from different orientations to show that uh, basically different orientations talk about corrective experiences. The language may be different, you know, it, it may be exposure, it may be risk taking, it may be whatever. Um, but we see this occurring regardless of orientation. And then to help the person go from conscious competence to conscious incompetence, there needs to be ongoing work of risk taking, which is number four, getting the corrective experience. And number three, processing it, becoming aware of what went on and how they took the risk and what the consequences were. And with that, it then helps them to go back and 
and have more corrective experiences. So in essence, facilitating ongoing reality testing is a synergy between three and four, increasing awareness and corrective experiences. And the corrective experiences help to further increase awareness. This is very complicated. Hopefully we'll come back to it. Um, it's an acronym which highlights for the therapist and for the patient what aspects of their functioning they need to become aware of and to change. Is it the situation? Is it their thought? Is it their affect? Is it what they want or need? What they do, the consequences and or the self-evaluation. And while this looks linear, it really can be drawn with arrows back and forth. Uh, and hopefully as we get to discussing uh, what we will be discussing later on in, in the, uh, among the panel, hopefully some illustrations can come through. So basically um, more information about all of this is uh, spelled out in an American psychologist article I published a couple of years ago, uh, and then a chapter with um, um, my colleague and former mentee, uh, 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 Catherine Ubex. I just no noticed a typo in there, but I'm not going to point it out to you. I know it, but <laughs> I'll have to edit that slide. Um, anyway, there, there are links here and these slides will ma be made available. Great. All right. Ah, thank you, Marv, for that uh, elegant articulation of core principles uh, and gives us certainly uh, a good summary of some of the uh, excellent points that you make. So let's go ahead and turn it over to Jeffrey and his vision of consensus and core elements of the world of psychotherapy. Okay. Um, so let's, let me see. So I'm, I'm really going to, I think, uh, agree with, with Marv in a lot of ways and, and hopefully add a little bit of precision. And I'm going to be talking about how filling in the formerly opaque infrastructure of psychotherapy can lead to further agreement. Um, now, wait a minute. Um, ah, okay. Um, for, the, for the first 120 years of psychotherapy, really until the 21st century, any, one, one person's guess about how psychotherapy worked was as good as another. Um, but in the last 20 years, we've gained a lot of science. And so the way I'm picturing it is we've gathered wonderful branches and leaves and foliage um, uh, about psychotherapy, but we've been missing the trunk and roots for a long time. And I think it's finally time that we have the ability to begin filling in the, the infrastructure. Um, and, and in doing that, I'm picturing a sort of a process that, that uh, first we need to be much sharper and clearer about what it is we're, we're actually trying to change. Uh, it's not DSM diagnoses, it's not syndromes, it's much more, it should be much more specific than that. And we'll talk a little more about it. And then once we've narrowed down what it is we're working with, then we can start to look at, well, what are the common characteristics that all of these problems um, have? And in doing that, it then becomes possible to bring in new recent neuroscience about change. And, and that neuroscience gives us some, some indications about what are the conditions that need to be fulfilled before change can take place. And then something magical happens. Lo and behold, the descriptions that come from neuroscience about what allows change processes to happen turns out to be very close to what Marv was just talking about, uh, to the clinical wisdom of things like Alexander and French's uh, um, um, corrective emotional experience and mindfulness and things like that. So it's kind of a hint that maybe we're on the right track if the results of neuroscience match so closely with what we get from our own, our own uh, years and years of clinical wisdom. And so hopefully we wind up with the beautiful tree that has a trunk and roots as well. All right. so, so let's talk a little bit about what is treatable in psychotherapy. 
Um, basically, the things that we work on are information processing, and it's when the mind's attempts to adapt um, are, have gone awry, awry in some way. So we, um, with Greg and several other of us within the special interest group on convergence, have kind of settled on a formula for defining the things that psychotherapy is good for, which are incredibly varied, but they all have, have in common that they're entrenched, because if they're not, then people don't need therapists. They're maladaptive, representing the unconscious mind's attempts to, uh, to cope, but to cope with circumstances that are no longer pertinent. And finally, they're patterns. They're things that we're concerned may repeat themselves at some point. Having defined what we treat, we now get down to being able to identify some common characteristics. All of these patterns are, are in some ways um, embodied and stored as neural networks and neural pathways. And those are laid down through long-term potentiation. That, the science of memory tells us that. We also um, know at this point that essentially universally, and there's, there's not much controversy here, that these maladaptive patterns, the things that cause trouble for people, are triggered. And they're triggered by subcortical, meaning limbic, emotions. Um, I could call them core emotions. There's a lot of trouble with, with nomenclature there. But subcortical emotion is what sets off a response. And furthermore, we also notice that essentially all of the maladaptive responses people um, bring into our office start out as adaptations to something that the brain interprets as a threat. So taking that information, we now have a, a rather close match with, with one model that's been well-researched, and that is the, the learned fear paradigm, where people learn to be afraid of a bell ringing um, because every time they hear a bell, they're going to get a shock. Um, and it turns out that there are only two ways of changing those responses. One is extinction, described by Pavlov a long time ago, and more recently understood on a biochemical level, and um, in which um, the, con the um, conditioned stimulus needs to be presented. It needs to be active, and then there's a temporary change in the response when, it's, when you get the conditional stimulants in the absence of the shock. Um, and that's, that what's known now is that what happens there is the cortex learns to send inhibitory impulses into the midbrain to block the response from happening. But what's, what, what goes on is the recognition of a threat still exists, and that's why this, this change mechanism actually is, uh, doesn't last. Eventually it fades away. And then there's the sort of the queen of change mechanisms, uh, only only de described um, uh, in detail in 2004, called memory reconsolidation, in which those neural networks that represent the problem um, can be updated according to new information under certain circumstances. And then finally, Marv has been talking a lot about new learning, about how people take in either cognitively or experientially or both new patterns of response that they may not have had available in the past. So those are three change mechanisms that operate within this learned fear paradigm. And, and um, there's a good argument for generalizing those to all of the kinds of problems that we treat in psychotherapy. What's interesting is that, that, act, that memory reconsolidation and extinction share the same requirements. The things that make one happen are very close to the things that make the other happen. In, in both cases, one requirement is that the neural net networks representing the old maladaptive pattern um, and, and its deep emotion, its core emotion, need to be in an active state. This is neurologically, this is one of the requirements. And the way we know that as clinicians is something very familiar. We see affect. When we see tears or some emotional, some bodily change, that tells us that there's something special about what's going on right now. The second requirement is exposure at more or less the same time 
to some new information that's surprising and contradictory. And I call it the antidote. And that neurophysiologist will tell you that that generates prediction error within the brain. When those two things happen at the same time, then extinction and or memory reconsolidation are able to take place. Um, and so if we take those specific requirements, plus the new learning, the three of them map very closely to techniques from diverse therapies suggesting generalization from learned fear to the full range of entrenched maladaptive patterns. Now, this is very similar to what Marv is saying. So in the end, biology says, first, that new patterns are learned through establishment of neural networks using long-term potentiation, okay? And psychology says new patterns are acquired through cognitive and experiential learning. Those are the same thing. Biology also says that old patterns are modified by extinction and memory reconsolidation, where both require activation of the old response and its core emotion, juxtaposed with exposure to new contradictory information causing prediction error. Well, when we look at what we already know through 120 years, uh, 140 years of psychotherapy, old patterns are modified by the corrective emotional experience, where emotional experience is contradicted by surprising new information. The therapist doesn't react the way the patient expo expects the therapist to react, and, there's, and something changes as a result. Or in mindfulness, for example, um, there's, a, there's a, a juxtaposition of the old self-centered um, response to something and a bigger perspective that, uh, that we call mindfulness that comes in and interacts with that old perception to re result in a new kind of awareness. It's a very similar thing. And, and those are two examples, but there are many more examples of how, um, how what we know about psychotherapy maps to this, um, this biology. Um, and so in this way, biology meets psychology and, and gives us a, um, um, a, a richer way to understand what we're doing and more precision about exactly what we need to do to make change take place. Now, I've left out something. Um, I'll get to that in the, in the next slide. But so just to recap, we're getting to this cycle where we, we honed in on what exactly we're treating. And then we looked at the common characteristics we bring in some new neuroscience to explain how change takes place. We look at the precise conditions that lead to change, and lo and behold, we get back to what we already know from, um, from um, many different um, psychotherapies and their ways of conceptualizing what happens. And so we arrive at the tree with its trunk and roots. Um, just to complete things, um, I haven't talked really about nonspecific facilitated factors, and Marv, Marv brought some of these in. Um, regulation of arousal um, is, is important, and there's been a lot of emphasis on the um, polyvagal theory, for example. Uh, support for motivation, I completely agree with Marv about that. Uh, we, every therapy needs to have safety and informed consent. And then we get to having a positive therapeutic relationship, which when you think about it, it maps to all six of the, of the other factors. It's a source of one, two, and three on the left, and, it, and it's a support for four, five, and six on the right. And so with those seven factors, um, I'm, I'm proposing that, that they together form this, this infrastructure, which is good for consensus in the sense that it doesn't really challenge or, or offer to change anything of existing theory. In fact, it supports and, and gives maybe some more precision sometimes to existing uh, theory. But, but it's something that fills in a gap that's been there for a long time, and it's high time that we, that we fill it. And in doing so, we arrive at, a, at a, a greater level of precision. And what I found in terms of, how, of teaching clinicians it helps clinicians to focus more on process rather than method, on how to optimize the process for a particular patient at a particular time in their journey, rather than, than following the dicta of, of uh, some, some sort of met method or protocol. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. All right.
Very good. If you can. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Jeffrey. Uh, so now uh, I'll share my screen. Uh, I framed it slightly different and just sort of gave an overview, a little bit of my narrative and some of the vision that's emerging, but I think that it will give a nice juxtaposition to both of those really fascinating uh, presentations of which I really uh, agree with a, a lot of what has already been said. So um, we got a, I think we'll have a lot of collaborative consensus here. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen in relation. Um, um, so I, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about uh, sort of summarizing a talk I just gave as the keynote for the New Zealand uh, Association of Clinical Psychology called Combined, Integrated, Unified uh, and it just gives a quick snapshot of my vision for a more holistic uh, and theoretically coherent approach to psychotherapy integration. Um, so uh, I got back in 1994, uh, I got aware of what might be called the problem of psychotherapy in no small part to uh, the icon that is here, uh, Marv Goldfried in relationship to uh, his leadership with Paul Wachtel, John Norcross and others. And, and also I encountered it when I was actually in the room. Uh, and what I mean by that is, hey, you learn about theory and then you get with individuals and you wanna be a healer and then you have to kind of figure out, you know, how to do that in the real world and how to meet their needs. And uh, of course, as a therapist, you see all sorts of different varieties and how do we extract patterns in relationship to that. Um, I wanted to be the best healer I could be. Um, for me, I, I was seeking some sort of a, a coherent framework and I think we see in these uh, conversations about how people, you know, how we got to kind of get to the basics. Um, and I was also like, well, how do, what are the key insights that are offered? Um, and I felt the best of the best had really powerful insights. And what I mean by that, when I saw a skilled psychodynamic clinician like Paul Wachtel articulate his version of reality that really spoke to me when I heard, uh, you know, Don Meichenbaum talk from a cognitive behavioral perspective that really spoke to me. Uh, and I wanted to, these are key insights. Um, how is it that they are afforded and do they stick together? Um, but when I was thought about my training, uh, that I did not see. Um, so my journey moved and I was like, well, what is the problem? I had the idea that actually maybe uh, if we had a coherent vision of what psychology was, what should happen is that the empirical research in psychology should be able to inform my practice. Uh, but actually what you see in relationship to that is that psychology itself, and Mike mentioned that kind of briefly, is really a very, very disorganized and pretty coherent, incoherent system. It has an enormous amount of fascinating domains of research, but, but there's a real problem of psychology, like what do we mean by psychology? Um, and uh, my own journey was sort of, hey, I wanted to, could I figure that out? And actually it's sort of accidental that I developed a system uh, that ultimately then transitioned into maybe there's a shift in perspective that we can take uh, to frame uh, the perspectives and allow us to see the edges uh, in relation. Uh, and uh, not only was I working on that, I got fortunate and went to James Madison University for my practice, uh, for my professorship, but it was a practice oriented program uh, that was combined integrated. And I'll explain very briefly as to what that is. Uh, and ultimately, the vision then that emerges in the training and education and philosophy is a unified approach to psychotherapy that we teach uh, in my program. Uh, so we really cultivate the attitude of a combined integrated or unified health service psychologist, which are psychological doctors anchored to a scientific coherent conception of human psychology. Um, so by combined, I mean combined across the practice areas. Uh, we have all of these different domains of practice and in particular in psychology of clinical counseling and school psychology, the combined philosophy, which was developed far before I got there, um, was the idea that actually all of the ways to approach professional practice, and there's a lot of unity there, and we can develop training and philosophy across these domains and develop an identity of psychological doctors, okay, or mental health doctors that have a particular um, background of biopsychosocial maladaptive patterns and how they can be inverted. In relationship to integrated, the, the philosophy really is to think systematically about looking across the various domains of psychotherapy uh, and then develop systematic approaches to interrelate them. And I think we've seen that with Marv and Jeffrey about how do you extract the core patterns, whether we're talking about general principles, uh, core developmental change patterns like uh, Marv identified, um, or fundamental change processes like grounded in neurobiology and learning that Jeffrey did. 
Um, I've developed a particular time of system that I'm not going to pay uh, much attention to, but it affords a way of actually translating some of the key insights into uh, adaptive processes across uh, that's contextualized in biological, psychological, and social domains, and retranslate some of the processes of adaptation into habits, experiential, uh, relational, uh, defensive, and justification. That sort of gets us from the paradigms and their key insights into ways of describing uh, people's behavior patterns. Um, and I've written about that in, in various contexts. Um, so in terms of unified, uh, what do I mean by that? It's basically, there's a question that I ask folks, and that is, well, what is psychology? Um, and part of my concern is, or one of my, is that at an abstract level, is there a way to think about the concept of what psychology is in a way that's somewhat coherent? Uh, I've offered some articulations about that. Um, and basically I'm interested in a big picture view that affords us a way to think about what psychology is similar to how we think about what biology is. Actually, biologists are pretty clear that biology is the science of life and they have a sense of what, the, what that means. Um, my particular interest is, is thinking about what psychology means. Uh, and then if we can create a framework for what psychology means, what's the implication then sort of from a, what I will call sort of a, a, a sensitive or integrated pluralistic top-down view. And that gives rise to unification which is seeing, taking a step back and seeing the paradigms. Mark talked about where the theory is sort of a high level of abstraction. Well, interestingly, this just takes a step back uh, above that uh, and suggests that maybe these theories can be seen in relation and that can afford us different perspectives. And there's a thing called you know, unification. We actually recently just shared a publication on this. Andre Marquis, the first author on that. Uh, but several of us talked about our own journeys in relationship to unification. Uh, unification follows in the path of psychotherapy integration, um, which looks at all the various paradigms and says, hey, what common elements can we abstract and what are the systematic ways in which we can relate them? So we have common factors, uh, and maybe we should rename common factors, common principles in honor of Mars re recent developments in relation and, and common learning changes. Uh, and I think what we're seeing there is a really rich and precise and meaningful specification uh, in both Marv and Jeffrey's work. Uh, there are also, of course, like Lazarus and other people have argued for technical eclecticism. Uh, there is the case of the language and the framing. Uh, Steve, uh, Stan Messer talks about, you know, an assimilative integrative frame and theoretical integration. Um, folks are familiar with this, uh, these domains uh, really quickly. It's like, hey, common factors, like what do they share and what level of language can we give uh, to individuals that fosters the healing process? We all are concerned with developing that. Uh, the technical eclecticism view is, hey, there's these different uh, approaches that are empirically supported. Should we utilize those? Um, the assimilative integrative view is grounded in that position and saying, hey, um, we should translate so we stay consistent with our language, but be open. And of course, the theoretical interview integration view is the idea that you can take particular perspectives, do causal explanatory perspectives, and synthesize them. Uh, and Paul Wachtel does that uh, very brilliantly in my estimation. So the unified view is just this idea that, hey, there is actually perhaps a way to take a step back uh, and instead of seeing the mountains and think about their pathways in between them, uh, actually view uh, the mountain range and see the whole mountain range in relation. Uh, and I've been working with some individuals on that. And the argument is if we can box in sort of the edges of our understanding, then we can zoom in. My hope is, is that the on the ground layers of articulation that Marv and Jeffrey are, are specifying that speak to me clinically can be bridged with a broad theoretical view. And if we can knit that together, that would be a very, very powerful synthesis in my view. And I'd love to dialogue about that. So uh, ultimately, I think there is a way for the field. Mike talked about sort of a fragmented, chaotic field that I do critique the field. I think we can have a more combined identity across the practice areas. I think we can create integrative systems across paradigms. Um, I think there is a way to define the field as more coherently and cultivate a psychological doctor or therapist uh, that then is centered in particular things that are shared. And then of course, there'll be specialization and difference. Um, I certainly acknowledge uh, this system is complicated <laughs> um, and uh, takes a lot to learn. Uh, there are a lot of things to debate. Maybe we can do that. Um, and it can be difficult to communicate. So there's certainly challenges going uh, the zoomed out view, no doubt. But I do believe sort of going back and out versus down and into the concrete and creating 
an interrelation could be potentially fruitful, even as there might be some differences on the utility of that. So that's the, the summary that I wanted to offer. I certainly have more specifics I could, but I just wanted to give uh, the, use the 10 minutes or, or so to give the overview. Okay, so we have now laid out uh, uh, our positions in relation. Uh, so I think you can kind of see, hey, the principles, uh, get clear about stage of change uh, and an analysis of adaptive patterns. What's the root of those in diagnosing them and changing them? Then wait a minute, what's a big picture view? What does it mean in relationship to our theories? Can we possibly interrelate those? We've laid those out. And uh, now what we're gonna do is shift gears a little bit um, and then see if we can turn it over to Mike. Uh, Mike's gonna walk us through some notions of common ground and then that will set us up to engage in some dialogical processes and discussion between us uh, to see what unfolds uh, through that process. So, Mike, uh, you're muted there, Mike. It's maybe, maybe helpful to have me muted, who knows? <laughs> okay, what I'd like to do is, um, wow, there's three rich, uh, rich perspectives here. And um, let me talk a little bit about uh, what creating common ground is all about, what that practice is. And then we'll see if we can uh, use it uh, to, uh, to work towards, see if we can work towards some sort of integration or synthesis of the various perspectives that we've just seen, see if that's possible. Um, so let me begin here. I hope you can all see my slideshow. Okay, so creating common ground in psychotherapy. Um, uh, Marv said in his talk, uh, rather than having different orientations on what can we agree? So he's looking at the fragmentation in the field and saying, my goodness, it's, it's all this cacophony. And maybe we can cut through that and just figure out what we can agree upon. That maps onto, uh, at least uh, somewhat, a principle of uh, the idea of creating common ground. And that is that creative, uh, that common ground in various perspectives is not found. We have this phrase, oh, let's find common ground as if it already exists, as if it's simply there under a bush to be found. And maybe it is in some places, but where there's disagreement, my suggestion to you is that common ground is not found. It has to be actively created, and it is created through a dialectical process, I suggest to you. And so what might that look like? Let's say we have um, uh, Marv and, and, and Jeffrey uh, on, on, one, on different sides. Um, Mike, you got muted there. So bridging divides on contentious issues. Uh, if we start off with Marv and Jeffrey, the common ground isn't there. It has to be actively constructed. A bridge has to be constructed. People have to put together some novel link, something new to bring those two people together or these three people together. And now this process of creating common ground, we created it uh, primarily uh, for dealing, it has its origins in everyday interpersonal relationships. Uh, uh, resolving divides in interpersonal relationships. And as I indicated to you, I brought it into the later area of uh, resolving socio-political divides. And there's two broad stages to the process of creating common ground, uh, at least in interpersonal and socio-political divides, maybe somewhat different than what we're gonna do today. And those two phases are one, collaborative problem solving, and two, dialectical problem solving. Collaborative problem solving has its origins in psychotherapy and conflict resolution literatures. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And dialectical process problem solving has its origins in theories of dialectical thinking. Let's start with collaborative problem solving, at least in the interpersonal world. What's the process? Well, we start off with different positions so often in an interpersonal engagement, in a theoretical engagement, in a political engagement. So, Here's two people who take different positions. They could be, these are political positions, but they could be theoretical ones. Immigrants are taking our resources, she says. He says, immigrants do the jobs we want. Let's not keep them around. And surface positions get batted back and forth all the time. 
Well, what's the what's at least one antidote to bridging those positions? Well, let's look at the human needs and feelings and and concerns and pleas and fears that underlie and motivate those positions. So in this situation, for example, her position of immigrants are taking our resources is embedded or motivated by a need, an underlying need or fear. I'm afraid that my way of life is going to be destroyed. And his position, uh, immigrants do the job, it's, it's embedded in a need or fear or concern. I wanna help people fleeing difficult situations. So while the initial superficial positions uh, seem very far apart, when we look underneath and we look at the needs and concerns and fears that underlie and motivate them, well, they become a little less far apart are certainly understandable. Uh, this person here probably can understand fear and the fear of having one's life changed. And this person here can certainly understand compassion and the desire to help people out. So in collaborative problem solving, we start with positions, whether they be political, theoretical, or what, and we look and we try to find the unmet need behind them. And once we find those needs, we bring them to the surface. We bring the needs to the surface and we get rid of the positions. We get rid of the political or the theoretical positions. And then what happens is we start to work on ways of meeting needs. What are those needs, those psychotherapeutic needs in our, or theoretical needs in our particular situation here? Uh, what are the solutions or, or that can meet the problem of those needs? And we start to just generate possible solutions and possible solutions and possible solutions until we come up with solutions that meet those needs. Common. Focus on underlying needs and fears uh, is more likely to bring about integration, at least in interpersonal situations, uh, um, than, uh, than the batting back and forth of positions. That's the first phase. Now, in a, a political context and in a theoretical context, um, this only gets you so far. Uh, so you can identify what your needs are, but so very often, a, a collaborative problem solving is effective only as long as the needs can be separated from ideological and theoretical commitments. However, in most forms of political, cultural, and theoretical conflict, needs and interests are often defined by ideological commitments. And so collaborative problem solving uh, is limited. We've got to do something uh, different and it's got to be something that's, um, it's actually a little bit uh, harder, much harder actually, in my view. And that is where dialectical problem solving comes in where dialectical problem solving involves the synthesis of opposites. So again, we saw before the, the two people with their different positions, well, they're opposite positions. Is it possible to actually synthesize opposites? Uh, and this is where dialectics comes in. And we have dialectics, the, theory, the, the, the common notion is you start with some thesis, that thesis generates an antithesis, that thesis and antithesis are under conflict, and that you create, you seek to create a th synthesis that transcends both thesis and antithesis. So thesis, nature determines development, brings about its antithesis. The environment determines development, which brings about conflict and a bunch of changes, which ultimately leads to a way to resolve the conflict, the epigenetic view that says nature and nurture influence each other and are inseparable as causal processes. The contradiction is resolved uh, and uh, you have a much more powerful theory. That's what dialectical problem solving tries to do. And what I'm gonna try to do, and we, we don't know where this is going to go, uh, um, to try to transform ideological commitments in theorizing about psychotherapy. Well, let's first identify the theoretical uh, positions and contradictions between the parties here, between people who advocate different theories and about and psychotherapy and practice. Don't avoid them, let's identify them. Let's not, let's not entrench in our different orientations. Let's actually, let's actually uh, engage each other. And then when we see something that we disagree with, we squint. This is a technical term. We squint and we identify whatever possible kernels of truth there are in the other person's theory and the other person's ideology. And in my view, we've already seen a whole bunch of kernels of truth in, in, in the commonalities that have been expressed in different languages so far today. You identify kernels of truth in the other's ideology, bracket the rest for now, and then ask, how can my 
How can our theoretical frameworks or ideologies change, if at all, by accommodating to the truths I see in the other? So it looks something like this. The process would look something like this. Person one has thesis A, nature determines development. That leads to its antithesis. Nurture uh, leads to development. Uh, now, when person A takes a look at evidence for nurture influencing development, well, they begin to modify their nature position. And the same thing happens when the person in the nurture view sees obvious in influences of genetics. And then what happens is that as they're modifying each of their respective views, perhaps it is possible to synthesize and bootstrap a novel synthesis. And that's what um, dialectical problem solving might look like. We want to try to do both those here today. In our dialogue, I want to start by trying to highlight the dominant uh, theoretical positions of each of the theorists. I want to try to use collaborative problem solving to find shared ways of meeting diverse needs. And I want to try to use dialectical problem solving uh, to moderate a discussion to see if there are theoretical ways in which we can synthesize uh, uh, agreed upon um, uh, a novel uh, ways of thinking or novel ways of theorizing uh, through synthesis. Uh, and as the talks were going on, I, uh, everything I wanted to do, I, I, I almost cast most of it aside and created something entirely different uh, because uh, I don't know where this is going to go because uh, of the richness of what was going on. So that's where we are now. So um, shall we move to the next phase? Yes, I, I think that first off, you know, that's a summary, uh, a really uh, elegant uh, summary uh, of the creating common ground process. Maybe we can check in and see if Barb and Jeffrey have any questions, but the next sort of docket item is for you uh, to lead us through what would be the next steps of a, of a collaborative process, a problem solving process, given what we've shared. Okay. Marv, you are, um, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Marv, you're muted there. Marv, you're talking, but you're muted. On the screen, on the lower left-hand side, the, there you go. Sorry about that. I, uh, I wanted to make some comment about uh, both Jeffrey's and, and Greg's um, presentation that, that I think um, may be a little bit aside from, from your presentation, Mike, because uh, I'm seeing collaborative problem solving working here. Hmm. <laughs> um, I don't see a difference and, and there's some agreements. So I want to, I would like to jump in and, and comment on, uh, on that. Um, By all means do so. Yeah. Um, okay, Greg, Greg your, um, your comment about psychology and being in, having inform what we do in therapy, I think is critical and, um, is lost within contemporary research mm. on psychotherapy. I uh, we've been misled over the past several decades by clinical trials yep. uh, and empirically supported treatment into the belief that that is the only form of evidence that right. is relevant to psychotherapy. From my point of view, clinical trials are very tangential. They don't tell me very much at all. What right. does inform me is basic research findings in psychology. Right. A couple of examples. And, and this, is, this is therapeutic magic if you do therapy, and it has an empirical database in general psychology. And that has to do with misattribution and reattribution of motive. Very powerful. You know, some people call it reframing, which is general, but one person is angry at the other. Um, and it's not, you, very often, it's not what the other person did, but what we perceive as the motive of the other person. <laughs> you don't care. You did it on purpose. So the same behavior can elicit different emotional reactions depending upon when the, how the receiver labels the other be behavior. I may okay. have you at seven. Where the hell are you? It's your favorite dish. You didn't even call. You're just so selfish. Partner comes in, clothes all dirty and wrecked. I was in a car wreck. 
I was in the hospital. Sorry, I couldn't call. Uh, the car is destroyed, but I think I'll be okay. What's the emotional reaction to the partner? Clearly, there's no longer any anger. Yeah. Person came late, same behavior. Person never called, same behavior. But there was a reattribution of motive. This is clinical magic. There's an extensive database on this. Okay. So that, you know, that is one example. The work Beautiful. of Kahneman and Tversky and predictions, mm -hmm. very, very relevant to therapy. Yes. We make decisions based on our ability to retrieve information that's relevant to this. Yep. There are people who don't retrieve their past successes because right. they're perfectionists and they butt it away. So it never gets, it doesn't get stored and therefore it can't be re retrieved. And their predictions are, I'm never going to be able to handle this, even though they may be very, very competent. Basic research on cognitive functioning, basic research on, on emotional functioning, all have relevance. Uh, and it's, it's being totally ignored in, uh, in, in the field. So I, you know, I, I think it's, it's crucial. Um, That's a, certainly a very strong point of agreement. Yes. So I'm wondering if Jeff, um, if you agree with what we've just stated, I'm going to just re restate it. Uh, what Marv is agreeing with 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 uh, Greg is that uh, basic psychological findings are uh, informed psychotherapy, even more so than clinical trials. And he gave the example of reattribution of motive. So would you agree that uh, that um, one basic psycho psycho um, basic psychology I I informs the therapy process and two um, that it may even be informant more than clinical trials. Okay. Um, yes, I, I want to see you and up you one. Um, <laughs> um, I, I very much agree in that misattribution magic. I use that all the time. I, I it's wonderful. Um, and, and people don't realize that. What I want to add is that in terms of need is I think there's a general principle that by and large, from the point of view of the clinician, Research that is universal is not explanatory. That is common factors, for example. It gives correlation, but not causation. And research that is explanatory explains things in, in, in non-universal terms, in local terms, depending on an orientation and so on. And so I think we have, we have insight with the kinds of level of abstraction that you're talking about, Marvin, that I'm talking about, and the over the umbrella that, that Greg brings to it, we're really talking about things that are, that are both universal and explanatory. And I think that that's kind of the gold standard for what's useful for clinicians. We need to know why we're doing what we're doing and how it's going to work at the same time, rather than just blindly following a, a method. So. Right. And the, and the embedded in what you're saying, Jeffrey, is a notion of um, of good science, mm -hmm. and that is the method used to study a phenomenon can often confound the results and say more about the method that's being used as well as the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So what research methodologists say is that you need to study the same phenomenon with different methods, which is called converging operations. Totally. So if you take basic research and you say, oh, I see it. If you take, uh, in psychology, if you take basic neurological research and it's like, oh, that seems an awful lot like what you're saying with basic research. And if you see it clinically, then you have three different ways of looking at the same phenomenon. And right. in my book, when all three agree mm -hmm. i put that up on the shelf and mm -hmm. i say this is solid fact and then i feel very comfortable in saying to my patient there's very good evidence basic and clinical that if you do xyz it's going to work mm -hmm. and i say it with a straight face and and, mm -hmm. and conviction <clears throat> how we do it the specifics and somebody raised the question about methods that's a whole other story Mm -hmm. right. Okay, um, I'm interested in what uh, Jeff and um, uh, um, uh, Greg have to say about what was just stated. 
and I'll make a, a, a comment, incidentally, as we go along here. We're, we're going to get a, it looks like we're going to get a good deal of consensus. Uh, we'll probably get a good deal of, of disagreement as well. We have to note, of course, the, that we have three, three people here. We're not looking at the entire field. Uh, so um, the, it'll be limited by that. But go ahead, uh, Greg and, and Jeffrey. What do you feel about um, these? Uh, uh, Greg and Jeffrey, what do you think of, feel about the, what Marv said about look for, I, and this is my summary, look for corroboration uh, between and among research clinical findings and methodologies rather than any one. Sounds Very much, I, yeah, no, I, I, I'm i loving the, the conversation because I, I think basic scientific principles serve as building blocks. Uh, so both in terms of our ability to generalize and our ability to narrow down mechanisms, if we can grab a hold of those. So I was liking what Jeffrey was saying about how mechanisms might provide certain explanatory things, universal principles that we can afford. What Marv said about the bridge between uh, research and the various levels of analysis, various convergence of methods, how basic science and then clinical, if you get aligned in a particular way, uh, you're, you're seeing lensing different way, but you get convergent validity through the lensing. Uh, that's, a, that's a very, very powerful thing. Uh, I'll say that I'm in the midst of um, uh, one of the, an ongoing uh, dialogos, just a, a uh, term coined by my friend, a cognitive scientist, John Verveke. And it's an ongoing episodes on uh, what's called the elusive eye, the nature and function of the self. Uh, so we are engaged in, you know, 12 to 14 episode series of conversations about the nature of the self. Um, he brings uh, the cognitive science view of what the self might be. Uh, I'm bringing sort of a clinical theoretical psychologist view. And then our fellow friend, uh, Christopher Maestro is an existentialist philosopher. Uh, so just in, we're trying to live out exactly what Marv said in relationship to sort of a science, a clinical, and then in this case, a philosophical vantage point on a construct and how to then utilize that. So that's a, yep, all sorts of agreement I have. Uh, yeah. Jeff, um, Jeff? Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much in agreement. I want to bring a, um, a, a definition from, from a diction, from a, a, one of the online dictionaries. What is theory? Theory is, quote, a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something, especially one based on general principles independent of the thing explained. And I think that gets to what Marv was talking about, about multiple approaches that produce the same results. And, and for me, the same thing with the, the neurophysiology and how that correlates with, um, with the wisdom from psychotherapy. Um, but I want to step back just a little bit because I think... In a way, the danger of this of this um, um, uh, webinar is that we all are in agreement, <laughs> and actually, when you get down to it, the things we're saying aren't really very controversial. So why is it so hard for us to come to consensus? And and my different people have have thought differently about this. Um, my guess is that that there's an awful lot of people who have had long careers in academics and they're the leaders who tend to get stuck with something that's worked for them and why should they change? And, and so in a way, what my um, um, sense of, of one of the needs that is, seems to me important is that young people need something that they can learn easily, that they can grasp, that's universal, that's explanatory and, and that they can put to use and as, they, as young people do that, what's going to happen is I think that they will feel more focused on process rather than method. And as people are focused on process, it's very natural to begin to reach into the many wonderful conceptualizations that have, that have been created over the years and, and turn out to be extremely useful in, in the office as one is practicing, for example, um, Marv's magic about misattribution. Jeffrey, Sounds... you, know, the, the, you put your finger on something very important. It goes back to what you were saying, Mike, about uh, the needs of different people. Um, I suspect a lot of people go into the field originally because they feel a need to help people in the best possible way. Uh, and that's what we are talking about now. What can we agree on that's going to improve our interventions? But there are other needs that exist in the field. Uh, there are needs to get promotion and tenure. 
<laughs> and in order to get promotion and tenure, you've got to produce something new. Mm. So what you do is you change the language and you use different jargon to refer to something that's been written about in the past and you develop a school mm. and you get some economic needs met, mm -hmm. uh, but you get prestige. And there are people who I will not mention by name um, that are doing quite well with their schools of thought, but I'm not quite sure that it's the needs of the patient that is being met. So I, it, it's a very, very tricky kind of thing. Economic professional needs um, sometimes, and, and maybe the needs for identity, and then of course the financial need for referrals by taking certain courses and being on the referral list of a popular school. And, and this certainly, you know, people became very interested in CBT during the uh, 80s when there was the NIMH collaborative trial on the treatment of depression. Yep. And I would get phone calls, do I do CBT? This was before the results were in. And I said, yes. But then I thought, how many people who are practicing, how many times will they say no before <laughs> they take a course in CBT? Jeff asked, uh, took a look at the three um, uh, common principles that we've already come up with here and said, hey, these look pretty, pretty banal, uh, not very uh, controversial. So what's the source of our controversy here? Why are we having such difficulty? Uh, I would like to address that question with another set of questions here. Take a look at these, please. Uh, one, how, if we're going to look for corroboration between research and clinical findings and methodology, how do we seek corroboration about different foundational concepts and presuppositions? It seems to me that different theorists and practitioners have different basic assumptions, differ in their basic assumptions and beliefs about foundational issues, including epistemology. Does that matter? And it's cousin, how do we seek corroboration and research findings when they are conducted from this framework of these various different uh, presuppositions? Um, it seems to me that that's an important divisive issue. How do we address those issues if these are banal? Uh, anybody? I don't think they're banal. I think they're starting points. Okay. Yep. But they don't give the whole answer. It doesn't tell you how to intervene mm -hmm. with a given individual. And that's a function of technique, which can be a function of orientation and practice. But it also, it's a testable kind of phenomenon. For certain individuals, certain techniques are better than for other individuals. But they all may reflect the same principle. So the principle becomes the starting point. But it it doesn't, the notion of common factors, I think, leads us to a dead end. Uh, why do you, why do you believe that? Thing, therefore, we don't, uh, we can feel good and uh, we don't have to do anything else. But if it's a common principle, then the implementation, the clinical implementation varies greatly and it's empirically testable as being a function mm -hmm. of the nature of the problem or the nature of the individual. So it's a starting point for research and a starting point for training. Okay, could somebody nominate a, uh, actually that's, it's premature. Uh, uh, eventually at some point I wanna ask, can somebody nominate a clinical principle that might be an integrative one? We may already have some, but mm -hmm. uh, other people, uh, uh, Greg and, um, and Jeff on these questions, uh, how do we see corroboration when we start from different uh, foundational assumptions about what it means to be a person? Right, I, I, I think that we wanna be clear about the framing. So what I'm optimistic about is that what we're seeing are three people from various sides of an integration puzzle achieving a lot of consensus. That's what it opens up. And, and, I'm, and I love the research and practice thing. I don't think we have to go too far back out from different perspectives to realize there's an enormous amount of controversy, okay? At levels of, so at different levels of specificity, Marv made a comment about RCT, for example, randomized controlled clinical trials, right? Um, we can agree on that maybe here. There, there's no way that the field would agree precisely because there are different epistemological commitments about truth and causation uh, that people are trained in in different ways. So we can acknowledge, um, you know, one of my concerns about theory is that actually when we use the term psychology, I don't think we actually know what we mean. <laughs> so that's an interesting point. And what I mean by this is just a multiplicity of different dimensions to that concept uh, that when you really boil down to it, there are huge amounts of difference. 
Um, so from my vantage point, I would say, yes, we should certainly not be suggesting broadly that, oh, consensus is easy, or even that our consensus here means that it is easy. Um, for me, what I'm saying is, or what I'm seeing is, wow, there is some consensus in this community right here. Uh, there may be some really good pieces to elucidate. Uh, the field itself is just unbelievably fragmented across a wide variety of different domains. Uh, and if we drill down to any particular debate, I think that we, if we got specific on certain issues, pretty quickly we'd probably find some pretty serious areas of disagreement, which may be very fruitful. And of course, if we're going to train people, that's necessary. So it's it's just a matter of what we are framing in relation as to whether or not we're going to be uh, elucidating consensus or at least to find it. And then we, then we can change the frame and find lots of disagreement, probably, certainly outside of this. Jeff? Yeah, so so I'm, I'm going to get a little more pushy here, um, which I don't like to be, but but I think that that there are a couple of things that really, really need to be promoted and 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 put in place. And one is narrowing down the the definition of what it is that psychotherapy uh, aims to treat. And and I think that that a lot of the research is horribly blunted by mushing together uh, various syndromes and entities and mixtures of, of symptoms. Um, as if they belong together when they don't. And so I think that the, that the way we treat pathology is extremely important. Um, and, and from there, um, being able to focus on a very few rather well-known processes like extinction, memory reconsolidation, and learning, th those, those processes are, um, allow us to, to be a lot more narrow. And those lead have the potential of an incredible amount of research that hasn't been done on how do you um, how best do you help somebody activate their uh, their core emotions in in context um, there's something like um, um, uh, accelerated experiential aedp is a is a whole therapy that's founded on activating emotional content um, that can be researched as a general thing, not just within that therapy's um, confines, but as a general a general issue, there are many different ways to to help people access their um, their deep feelings along with their with the 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 content that goes with that, and and that's one element that's that's a necessary requirement for some of those change processes to take place. That research isn't, I, to my knowledge, is not really being done because there isn't a general um, uh, agreement. So I think that somehow that maybe it's, maybe what I'm really saying is that it's the marketing of the stuff that we already agree on that's the problem rather than, um, than the fact that we don't really, um, uh, that our, our, our view of things isn't, isn't congruent. Well, some of the, Jeffrey, some of the research is being done. Uh, by Les Greenberg and his students and his former students. Right. Where, mm -hmm. For example, if somebody has what, what they call, and, but it's within a, within a conceptual frame. So right. if you have bad feelings toward a parent, mm -hmm. a live parent, then there's a process you go through. And then the question also becomes, the, the, uh, the question also, uh, becomes like how much anger needs to be expressed in a two chair exercise mm -hmm. in order to result in a positive outcome. And they can calibrate that if it's too little or if it's too much, if it's too little, then there's not the kind of emotional arousal you were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it's too much, then the person can't cognitively process it. So the interaction of that, and that's very valuable as a guideline for, for the clinician. Absolutely. I do still think that there's a marketing problem there because the clinician who doesn't happen to be an emotion focused therapist yeah. is going to miss out on that. That's right. That's right. And that's why a certain amount of emotional arousal mm -hmm. needs to take place in order to have a corrective experience. Right. Is that because the person needs mm -hmm. to find out that they're approaching something, they're apprehensive. And they're saying, so there's an emotion, there's a, pre a prediction, it's going to really be terrible. 
they take the risk mm -hmm. and it's like, oh my gosh, nothing bad happened. Mm -hmm. And there's relief. Mm -hmm. And that is the corrective experience. And then you mm -hmm. process that by mm -hmm. saying, what did you think was going to happen? Right. And what happened? Mm -hmm. What does that say about your predictions? And then they learn to mm -hmm. step back when they feel anxious and make the predictions. Oh, I'm making a prediction. Maybe mm -hmm. I ought to hold off and take the risk and see what happens. And there's your and, affiliation. Right. And that, that regulation of arousal was number four on my seven things. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I think, no, I, I think a lot of people who do CBT um, don't recognize that at all. And I've mm -hmm. criticized mm -hmm. this in, uh, in some of my writings. They need to have a certain amount of emotional arousal. Absolutely. So let me um, uh, ask you, uh, uh, re-ask these questions again, uh, with a, perhaps a, a, fo a focus on this one here. Why is there then fragmentation in the field? It is perhaps uh, we can we can draw upon what Jeff said a few seconds ago when he said, if you're not an emotional therapist, emotional uh, 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 experience or emotional therapist, you're going to miss that emotional process that they were just talking about. Well, you could say the same thing about some other stuff. If you're not a cognitive behavioral therapist, you're going to miss the cognitive part. If you're not a sociocultural therapist, you're going to miss the um, you're going to miss the, the role of human values, etc. Uh, in, 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 if you're not a if you're if you're a directive therapist, you're going to miss uh, the the the, uh, the the non directive uh, process. So. Those fragment, those that's fragmentation, and that comes from fundamental two things. It seems to me, one is different values and, and presuppositions. One and two, focusing on different parts of an integrated person. So I ask, what is the source of fragmentation in in, in the field, and what do we do about it? Well, I was, I was saying before, economic, um, personal development, the need. To have somebody to play with who thinks like you, you know, to belong to the club. I mean, there's craziness out there, and it's not only in politics. <laughs> <laughs> right. I no, I mean, I think that the, you know, this just goes along with what Marv said. I mean, the, the history of psychology, in my estimation, is trying to both the science and its application is carving out a slice of the territory to get a frame on it. And then you have gurus that carved out slices of the territory and then felt, you know, they were charismatic and brilliant and they did their thing and they got, um, uh, they got followers. And then the people that spoke that language and got employed for that process and then were rewarded for that. And then that created a particular kind of landscape of a, what I call a multi pre paradigmatic uh, and multi meaning there's all these different schools of thought pre paradigmatic meaning in, in Thomas Kuhn's traditional sense, he really meant a paradigm is something that could bring the whole system together. Psychology, it's so vast, complicated and multifaceted uh, that entering into the terrain, there really has never been a capacity to develop a Kuhnian paradigm for psychology. Exactly. And, and we've had look at look at the tradition. What, what is it? 120, 140 years. It, I, I keep losing count. Um, it was a, 20, probably 140 by now, mm -hmm. some of the early uh, Freudian stuff. So, so what we used to have were Freudians, Jungians, Sullivanians, named after the leader. Now what we have are, we have alphabet soup. So what do we do about that? CBT, <laughs> CBT DBT, CBASP, um, we, we have all of these different acronyms. Uh, so we have a history of thinking in terms of competing schools of thought. So what do we do about that? The question, people? Mike, is how do we change that? That's, that's I, what I I'm asking. How we change that is mm -hmm. by changing how we train. Yeah, I, okay. I want to add something about that. I learned a, 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 few, uh, a couple, few years ago that the middle class population of the world is going to double between 2010 and 2030. And to me, what that means is they're going to be not hundreds of thousands, but millions of people moving from concern about survival to being concerned about the quality of their lives. And I think the, the international attendance at this, um, this webinar um, speaks to the fact that, that our field is, is a 
is in the process of experiencing an incredible expansion to the rest of the world. And I think that we need to pay a lot of attention to, to teaching psychotherapy in a way that's accessible to people. I'm afraid that one of the things that happens with psychotherapy is that we teach very, very complex intellectual structures from all of these wonderful gurus and geniuses, which are all good. But what happens when clinicians actually leave school and get into practice is they kind of shed all of that and just become a nice person, which isn't very effective. So, uh, now, there are some steps now that are being taken to change the model of clinical training. Because I, our method of clinical training and supervision is certainly 20th century. I'm not quite sure of 19th century, but let's say 20th <laughs> And we are certainly not making use of all the clinical, um, all of the research and all of the technological resources that we now have. And some people are recognizing this. Um, Catherine Eubanks, Chris Moran, James Boswell, Mike Constantino are taking little vignettes, clinical vignettes, like a, a problem with the alliance or problem with motivation, talking about the research on this and using the research findings to train clinicians on how to deal with these issues, making use not only of the literature, but also videos, illustrations. It's a bottom-up approach. It's empirically based, but it's certainly informed um, by clinical need. And it's trans-theoretical and it's trans-diagnostic. Okay, so what I'm hearing, uh, when I asked the question of why is there fragmentation, we said that uh, you've identified a whole bunch of things and what, what do we do about it? You said um, uh, to, to treat, uh, we have to change the way we train. Uh, we change the way we train people. That raises the question of what is it that we're going to train? Let me see if I can put some words in, into the mouth, into your mouths that I think I'm hearing. I may, I'm not sure, but please uh, tell me if I'm wrong. It almost seems as though what you're saying is that there's a need to seek some sort of holistic theory and practice that you're looking at multiple 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 research findings from multiple different areas and that they need to be corroborated and integrated in some way and that maybe that there's a need to develop a consensus model of psychological functioning or if you will a simple consensus model of psychological functioning would these be principles that you're suggesting um why or why not I, I think it, it's a little bit different. There's a concept in the field of psychotherapy process research called markers. And that's an indication in, during the course of therapy that something needs to be dealt with, either because it's a problem or because it represents change. So the therapist can pick up on a lapse in motivation by what is done by the, by the person or what is not done by the person, by what they say, by their tone of voice. And this can be coded and articulated. And there is research on the process of change on how to fix these things. So it's very, very much a bottom-up, clinically based, but with a research background. And you can say that you know it's a crossroads in therapy you can say that there's maybe a few hundred typical issues that therapists confront. So you can take those and you train people in how to deal with these issues together with understanding principles and everything else, together with understanding the techniques and the methods of dealing with that because they can learn that as well as identifying the issues. So it's a very pragmatic but yet empirically and clinically based approach to training. Yeah, I certainly support that. I'll also say that I do come with, or at least my journey took me towards more of a macro level view that then led toward pretty much exactly, or at least one way to frame it was the way you talked about it, Mike, was sort of like um, a particular way of understanding the different domains of human functioning uh, that get outside the paradigms, but I also think are consistent with research uh, that afford sort of a common language. Uh, so like the CAST model I developed said, rather than thinking about behaviorism and behavior therapy, think about habits and lifestyle. Rather than thinking about experiential therapy, think about emotions uh, and emotional functioning. 
Uh, instead of psychodynamic, think about relationship systems and defensive processes that are cognitive and uh, narrative, it's justification, uh, language-based justification process. Um, so, I, and one of the things that would really be, I think we would actually achieve, and that's just never really been happening, if you could have sort of a basic architecture and do what Marv was saying and saying, hey, okay, here's a problem with motivation, right? And, and here's, a, here's a miss or a rupture with the therapist around motivation. Uh, and then you would have a general model that says, oh, okay, this is how the therapist and patient are tracking each other. This is sort of the vector of investment of the patient. The therapist misses because you can say this, if they're going to miss this way, that's going to activate a negative defensive reaction and the patient withdraws. And indeed, you can even see that in their body. The, if we say that's where the investment is in the prediction that the person is making, if the therapist could have introduced a surprise, okay, that then afforded a particular hope that would have engendered a different body reaction from them and then created a different kind of cycle uh, of exchange and repaired that. And if you can then track the micro analysis of that with a generalized overarching model and show how maladaptive processes trap people and then stick them and freeze them, and then show how therapeutic processes can enter that, give different prediction models. And I mean that like in a deep intuitive sense, and then afford a reciprocal opening of various possibilities. Are you done ready to model like that? And then all of a sudden, yeah, I think you would begin to be able to see, wow, this is working across lots of different problems. Okay, um, I wonder, uh, uh, um, one of the things I see that is a difference between uh, um, uh, Marv and, um, and Greg, I think, I could be wrong here. Uh, uh, Marv, you, you're talking about um, uh, kind of a, 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 a more simplified model uh, of psychological functioning or therapy, even a non theory you're, you're not looking for a, a theory. Am I right about that? Correct. Uh, 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 yeah. But Greg, Greg, on the other hand, has a very, very complex theory. Uh, um, and, and it seems to me that he's <coughs> suggesting that what we need is a comprehensive, uh, a multi-layered theory to inform what we do. It seems to me that what um, what um, what uh, uh, um, both Marv and Jeff are suggesting is that we need something much more simplified, and even um, I'm going to uh, all up the ante like 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 Jeff uh, for no better reason than to, than to be a devil's advocate. It almost feels almost non-theoretical, a theoretical Marv and Jeff. Uh, uh, more Marv than Jeff, I think. Would you describe your your, your system as a theoretical? So uh, my question to you is, um, uh, uh, to what extent do we need theory or complex theory to inform? All right, all right guys, see, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, I, I was, as a graduate student, I had a reading in one of my courses, a very, very insightful article by a, a very insightful psychologist whose name lives on, Skinner. And the title of the article was, Are Theories of Learning Necessary? 1950. Yep. This was when I was studying theories of learning. <laughs> I was course. studying Hull, I was studying Tolman, <clears throat> and they were fighting. So Hull <clears throat> at Yale and Tolman at Berkeley had these elaborate theories and they were conducting research. And here is Skinner at Harvard looking at this and saying, you know something? <clears throat> if your research is based on trying to prove a theory, those findings may disappear once the theory is no longer popular. And I asked my students, um, and, 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 and Skinner said, it's better to build from the bottom up findings that we can agree on and build your theory that way as an extrapolation from research rather than top down. So he says that this research will disappear. So I asked my students, have you ever heard of Hull? Have you ever heard of Tolman? <laughs> and they never did. And I said, have you heard of Skinner? And they say, yes. And I said, well, that's, that's my case. So Mike, that's my feeling about theory. Have they heard of Chomsky? <laughs> <laughs> but my, there is, uh, somebody once said there's nothing as um, useful as a good theorist. Well, I would add there's nothing as dangerous as a live theorist. 
because she or he will do all possible to make sure that the theory remains intact. And it's more defense of theory than it is of advancement of the field. And then when we get down to the nitty gritty and I go right back to the two people sitting in the office or again, or in front of a screen that are doing therapy, patient um, therapist. What is the therapist doing that is helpful? And what they do behind closed doors is not necessarily theoretical. We've done some research on that also to show that there's greater similarity among therapists in crucial sessions um, that is not manual driven in comparison to therapy sessions that are driven by the manual. The manual makes us different, but these are master therapists who submitted tapes and basically um, they're not all that different. Um, I wonder, Greg and Jeff, if you want to, um, mm -hmm. um, I'll get your name in here somehow. Uh, yeah. Could you, first of all, Marv, would you agree with what I've written here? Uh, I'd like that to be in your own words, uh, uh, that we don't, we don't necessarily need yeah. general theories. Theories should come from the bottom up. Yes. And there's nothing as dangerous as a live theorist. That person may, will try to make the data conform to the theory. Right. Um, uh, one you other don't little... go to a physician and say, what is your theoretical orientation? Um, okay, you Greg. Go, and you say, can you help me with this problem? Greg, your thoughts on this. What is your position on this? Um, yeah, my position is we need theory, definitely. Um, uh, uh, you know, we, we certainly remember Skinner and he's certainly one of the most cited uh, characters in the field. Uh, and it's also the case that uh, the vast majority of academic textbooks uh, define psychology, not as the science of behavior, but the science of behavior and mental processes, um, because there's theory about neurocognitive functioning that Skinner and his whole model of epistemology said, no, uh, we can't even describe what mental processes are. So the numbers of people that are actually radical behaviorists are pretty small. And I think if you look at the size of cognitive science uh, with its at least model of neurocognitive functioning, um, you could certainly argue that the at least some notion of intervening variables uh, and all of that. No, are, no, but listen, I totally agree with that last point. When I cite Skinner, it's not because of his theories, but his approach to science. Right. What, right. what approach to science is, is very, that? Very, very different. Which is yep. very, very different. Could you just put some meat on those bones? Mm -hmm. that, that the approach of science, how would you describe it? I believe that? that people think and feel and plan and have needs. Skinner played that down. It's just a question of whether you build your science from top down or bottom up. Right. So, mm -hmm. so, so he, now, here's- now, I, don't, I don't know that much about, <clears throat> about Einstein, but his theory came from observation. Uh, I, I think certainly if you're gonna be grounded in science, virtually all sciences, uh, and I'm certainly grounded in science, uh, most certainly people do think of science as a combination of theory and empirical research and the iterative loop between yes, them. Yes, as long as the theory has a basis in research. Yes, okay. Well, certainly I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, that. Yes, the, the theory needs to be tied. It, I believe that science operates based on what's a correspondent uh, approach to knowledge or epistemology, meaning that you build a model and a map. And at some level, there has to be feedback loop between what the theory is modeling or mapping in reality yeah. and the data that is engendered in relationship to that to feed back into question its falsifiability, its competition right. with other particular kinds of theories. But then yeah. you, know, you, you get somebody with a school of thought um, like um, ACT, ACT, mm -hmm. the big package, you compare yep. it with a control group and you say, see, ACT is good. Well, it's like, what aspect of it? It's just, it's just a whole package. It's probably not gonna be any better than some other kind of, the, the control groups that are often used are very weak control groups. Uh, the control groups that are used in test, testing mindfulness are weak controls. They don't trust, they, 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 they don't compare it with relaxation. 
Yeah. Jeff, Jeff uh, um, please jump in, please. Yeah, yeah, two things. So, so one is I really think that, um, that theory is very, very helpful. And maybe that's a personal thing that because I want an explanation. I, want, I don't want to just do something because statistically somebody found that, it, that it's better. I want, to, I want to do it because I have some rationale for, for doing that. So it's, 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 a, it's a need and maybe not everybody has the same kind of need. Um, but then given that, that if, we, if we assume that theory is important, I had this conversation just recently um, the difference between a good detective and a lawyer. A good detective holds off on drawing conclusions and lets a lot of different hypotheses float in their mind. And then as they're, as they're holding these, these hypotheses with a light touch, they're looking at observed data and, and waiting for it to, to gel into some kind of a picture. On the other hand, a lawyer figures out what he wants to prove and then looks for the evidence to prove the, the conclusion that's already been drawn. And obviously, I think we want to be more like the good detective than the, uh, than the lawyer. Let's see if we can do one thing. Let's see if we can synthesize something that you all agree upon with this here. Uh, 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 Marv, is there anything in Greg's statement that you agree with? Could you repeat yeah. the, you said we a need, lot. Uh, which, which right, of this right here, what's on the screen. We need theory. Psychology is a study of behavior and mental processes. Skinner isn't going to help us understand mental processes. We need a theory to do that. Well, I did agree. Okay. I, okay. I said that, that I don't believe in Skinner's radical behaviorism. I believe right. in his methodological approach to right. the development of science which is very, very different. And some people call it methodological behaviorism okay. than radical behavior, behaviorism. So I do think that it's, it's different. And you know, maybe it's a question of what we mean by theory. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. are we confusing it with a principle? So if we say the principle of corrective experience is that the person, because they become more aware, because they have a good alliance with their therapist, because they know that their behavior now is based on stuff in the past that no longer is relevant and that it's possible that they, life will be better if they do things differently with some emotional trepidation and prediction that it's not going to work. They take the risk and it works. Is that theory or is that principle? Interesting. Yeah, great question. So, I, so that sounds like principle to me because what's missing is, is the explanation of exactly why that process works. Do you believe that we need an explanation of why of the process works, um, uh, Marv? And would you call that theory? Yes, I would call that theory. But the first step is coming to the agreement. And then we figure out the theoretical explanation for the process. If we don't, if we don't answer the question on what can we agree, okay. then all we're doing is spinning mm -hmm. theories after theories right. after theories. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like, let's do this. Well, let's do this. We have only a few minutes left. Let us see if we can identify amongst at least the three of you a series of principles that you can agree upon. And we should be able to do that because you've already done it, it seems well, to me. Well, we've, we've had the, the principle that Marv just talked about. Of, of the corrective emotional experience. We've had that since 1946. So it's a, it's a good long time. And, and I don't think there's a whole lot of disagreement at this point that that principle is holds. So, so I, I guess I'm asking, what are we, what are we missing? Where do we, where do we need to go with that? Right. So I would certainly agree that the, and, and have uh, that, for example, I mean, there are a couple of interesting, I definitely, there are differences uh, and, and we can get in those, but I can say absolutely corrective emotional experience in the way you described that Jeffrey in particular. And I think it's also in Marv's principles uh, is, is well articulated. Uh, you know, there are different ways to uh, um, frame that, but that's certainly a big agreement in my, that people have trouble with certain kinds of learning emotional processes uh, that we, that much of psychotherapy is like becoming aware of those processes that have trapped you. Uh, gaining new frames on that and then correcting those and then learning how to be different. So that would follow Marv's um, 
in unconscious incompetence all the way to unconscious mm -hmm. competence uh, down the road, uh, all of that. So there's stage of change process element. Uh, there's principles of, that they're maladaptive, especially in relationship to emotional learning and the uh, cultivation of correction around that. So it's definitely, I think that's at the heart. And, and I would say that, yeah, if you enter into psychotherapy, the vast majority of psychotherapies will come at that, will arrive at that in various ways. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be great if we had an articulation of that consensus wise. So corrective, would you see that, would, you, would the three of you agree that the, the need to, I've heard this, the need to introduce mm -hmm. some degree of moderate arousal, uh, not too much arousal, not too little arousal is necessary to, to promote psychological change? Yes, they need to care, yes. Yes. absolutely. Yes, well-established, good principle. Okay, how about the need to prompt awareness of both maladaptive uh, activity and then uh, Act, then adaptive action in the psychotherapeutic process, which is something I think, Marv, you've talked about. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Marv mentioned that, that in our consensus statement, we uh, actually uh, argued that the, a, a unifying way to frame uh, the problems are through entrenched maladaptive patterns uh, and that then the therapeutic process, and I think Marv's competence speaks basically to this, uh, is to engage in various elements that uh, you know diminish the process of maladaptive entrenchment and cultivate new paths uh, of adaptive investment. Right. Well, to become aware, I, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> Sullivan coined the term uh, uh, a um, having, having a senior moment, just great at an international conference. Take your um, time. Participant observer. Right. Of course. Right. And he coined it for the therapist who participates, but also observes. Well, right. the change process of becoming aware is that the patient becomes a participant observer in her or her, her, her or his own life. And different theories have different words for it. It's called reflective functioning. Mm -hmm. It's called cognitive restructuring. <laughs> it's called observing ego. Yep. It's called um, self-observation. It's called metacognition. It's called decentering. It's called mindfulness. It's called insightfulness. Well, Where Marv, the person, Marv, yeah. I'm sorry. Would would you agree that that it is um, useful and worth pursuing as a working hypothesis that the that the mechanism of of memory reconsolidation provides an explanation of how when those two forms of information come together at the same time in the person's mind, for about five hours, the window is open for reconfiguring of neural networks that, that hold that information. And that if you sleep after, after you, it's presented, you'll get even better results. Um, and, I don't and know that, enough about neuroscience to give you an intelligent answer, but... It, it, but it sounds like it very much parallels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it intriguing to you that there might be an explanation for why that, that thing that's been described in so many different terms is actually uh, important? Jeffrey, if there were not neurological changes in the brain as a result of mm -hmm. therapy, mm -hmm. I would be totally amazed. Right. <laughs> Good. Of course. <laughs> and And... I've seen in session when somebody does something and they say, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. I think that there are neurological things going on. I don't know what they are, but I'd be amazed if there weren't. Actually, this raises a question that may serve as a bridge uh, to get us into then the next seminar. And I'll, I'll ask you about, because Jeffrey, you and I have had some conversations about this. Um, that because I really like your angle, but I think that it's a bit reductive, meaning that at times to try to condense all of psychotherapy into the uh, understanding of transformation of corrective emotional experience through reconsolidation of memory um, doesn't do justice to the complexity of psychotherapy. Uh, and, and we can talk about whether that's the case, but I'll, I'll throw this out there. I, my friend, Waldemar Schmidt, who is a, uh, a longtime friend of mine, longtime interest in uh, psycho, both psychotherapy, but he's trained as a pathologist, okay? 
uh, a liver and kidney pathologist. He's a professor of kidney and kidney disease. Um, and as he transitioned from his study in liver and kidney pathology into psychiatry and psychology and psychotherapy, as he retired, he told me something that I, had always stuck with me and I'd like us to reflect on that. He was like, Greg, you know, the first thing that we learned uh, when I was studying the diseases of kidneys and livers was what a healthy kidney or liver looks like. Like what's an optimal functioning picture of the kidney and liver when it's looking like and utilize that as a reference point, okay? Uh, so this does raise a very deep, I think, philosophical and value laden question, which is what is an optimal human being? What's optimal functioning, okay? Is it simply the absence of entrenched maladaptive patterns or are we also referencing individuals who exhibit optimal functioning in a particular way? And how does that, how do we engender that? What does that actually mean? Are we, and then are we, do we become secular priests as Thomas Laz says? What is our role in thinking seriously uh, about what the, you know, the meaningful life is? What's the good life? Uh, are we trying to cultivate eudaimonia uh, from a positive psychology perspective? And what actually is our role in relation on the one hand? But if we, if we don't take that role, how do we actually reference where people are as opposed to just the absence of symptoms? So that might be an interesting conversation if we flip this around to think about kind of the role of psychotherapy and the values uh, that we bring to bear, because that also might get us into some areas of why there are big differences or at least controversies in relationship to that. That will certainly get us get, bring about a great deal of, of disagreement, to be sure, <laughs> uh, especially because, you know, I would suggest that the idea that that theorizing and research should go from the bottom up uh, um, uh, 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 marginalizes the primacy, I would suggest, of values and um, uh, uh, shared values and um, in the in determining what uh, optimal is optimal is not an empirical is not something that could be empirically described it's a it's a value system and, and and those value systems figure into our observations and to the extent that that is true uh that's going to make it difficult to uh to come up with uh, the theory and research that is uh, consensual it's 352 we have eight minutes mm -hmm. would it be nice <laughs> to have a question or two yes uh, that would be so uh if you Maybe, well, maybe we, we can bring, than, check we, in with. Okay. We have more than a question or two. And, and <laughs> I think we got quite a few. Here I, comes Laura. I felt a little bit uncomfortable about all these questions coming in and not being able to address them. I've been trying to look at some of them, but it's very hard to do that and also be part of the, the, the panel. Um, you know, may, maybe some of these, if we can't address them now, we could address them at the CEPI conference. That'd be great. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So just so all attendees know, I've been uh, taking notes on your questions and we'll be passing them along to our presenters today so that you, uh, that you guys can think about that for the CEPI conference. But there is one question that stood out to me that I thought would be a great one to end on today. Mm, um, and I'll just read it off. This is from Catherine Eubanks. Too much fragmentation is a problem, but one could also argue that some degree of diversity is important that diverse complex humans perhaps need some diversity of theories and approaches to meet their diverse and ever-changing needs. I'd be curious to hear the panelists talk some about that. Well, what we're talking about, the jargon for that are uh, at least one of the labels are the moderating variables, uh, the characteristics of the patients. So in supervision this week, <clears throat> I've seen a, a range, or, or my, my supervisees have seen a range of patients. Some of them are able to have a metacognitive awareness. You tell them that and they step back and they say, oh, I got that. Some of them you show that staircase slide that I showed them and they get it. Others don't get it and they have to write down stuff. Well, what were my thoughts and what were my feelings and what, and the writing down is kind of an aid for people who don't have good metacognitive awareness, or as the psychodynamics say, folks say, reflective functioning, um, or they can't step back and observe. So the characteristics of the patient will make a difference with regard to the way the principle becomes implemented, namely the technique. And that is empirical. 
we can get hunches on this. Like, so my hypothesis is if you do an assessment of metacognitive awareness ability on the part of a patient, and then you track them into two conditions, one where there's self-recording, one where there's not self-recording, or you stratify according to level of awareness, you'll find some interesting interactions, um, not in creating a change in pathology, but maybe creating a change in awareness as the outcome measure. So it's a very different kind of research. It's a research on process. Um, and if we believe that certain processes are agreed upon, then we don't have to do any elaborate clinical trials. I mean, some of the clinical trials, are, are, it's just dumb. Nobody has done a controlled study on whether or not parachutes work. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> Right, right. Which 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 group are you in there? Yeah, yes, that, that, that doesn't work out. So very good. Um, I, I I'll I'll just jump in very quickly and say I think that uh, sort of the I see this as sort of the dialectic between on the one hand chaos, which would be hyper pluralism and fragmentation, and uh, versus order and then extreme rigidity. So at one level, there's a real dialectic between you know order and chaos uh, along those lines. I think in terms of my own sensibility, I consider myself sort of an integrated pluralist. Uh, and that sort of speaks to the idea of, yes, there has to be sort of coherence and order on the other hand, on one hand, but diversity of views uh, is really key. And as far as the person goes or, or the client or patient, uh, you know, I begin personality theory with the argument that, hey, in some ways we're all alike, uh, in some ways there are key dimensions of individual difference, and in some ways we're completely unique uh, and holding that and holding that in proper relation is, you know, the task of a complex thinker. And I, I, I hope that we're able to accomplish that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think um, the, the, the diversity and, and all is, is really wonderful. And it corresponds to the fact that that patients will hear you drone on about something and then they read it on a, on a, on a, a podcast or hear, hear it on a podcast and all of a sudden they come in and they say, oh, <laughs> you know, so. That's so. what you were droning on about. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think that the, uh, the, the question that the, um, the, the question's a very, very good one about diversity. Uh, uh, um, I think that um, one of the things that we've seen here today, I think we, had, we don't have enough diversity. Uh, we don't have enough, we don't have enough disagreement. For me, what, what comes out of this section here, this, this uh, symposium or this webinar is the need for cross uh, paradigmatic discussion. We need to get people from different uh, orientations in the same room uh, uh, to disagree, to examine their pre-theoretical assumptions and see if we can, um, if we can uh, uh, bootstrap uh, uh, common ways of, 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 of thinking. I, I... That's what I thought 40 years ago. Oh, do you think when differently we, now? Yes, when we started CEPI, which was, that was the specific purpose. Uh, I agree with Marv. Yeah, I think the questions we address are key. Mm -hmm. it, it well, why, do you, why do you disagree with that statement? That's, that's for, Well, that's it's 40 true. years of being involved in CEPI and finding out that we still have incredible disagreement at our meetings. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing this for 40 years mm -hmm. because we have not asked the right question on what can we agree. Yes, I think I think I think that's so then wouldn't it wouldn't it be we get people from different paradigmatic frameworks asking that very question? We have not crisply spelled out that question in CEPI um, for all, for until very recently. Yeah, and I think that's what, uh, to me, this is why this is actually very encouraging. I know there was a lot of agreement, but actually the amount of agreement relative to often the amount of disagreement, this yeah. is actually quite, and I, and I certainly, we can, we can think about disagreement next time. There's a theory question we never really ca caught, but I really do think there's, relative to the sentiments and the history, I think the amount of agreement here is very positive. Yeah, Greg, we, we don't have to worry about not finding things to disagree on. We've been doing it for 140 years. <laughs> right, no, mm -hmm. I know, that's what, I'm, I'm, a, I'm agreeing with you there, Marv, ultimately. Yep, <laughs> yep. All right.
Well, the good news is the conversation continues. The CEPI conference will be held on June 10th to June 12th. So if you'd like to follow up on some of what was talked about today, I'm sure that will be coming up all conference long. Right, um, we can send out a note exactly when it is. I meant to make a note about that, this, this yep. particular version. Okay. Yep, and uh, the recording of this presentation as well as the associated slides will be posted to the CEPI website and accessible to you for free. Though we would love to see you join CEPI, so if you are interested in becoming a member, please check out our website at cepiweb.org. I think you're going to okay. send them the information for both I CEPI will do that right now. That's great. Great. Thank you, Lauren, for uh, you, Lauren. guiding us through. And, and thank, thank you, you to each of you guys here. And thank you, folks, wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks for coming and, and yeah. listening. Thanks to each of the panelists. I really appreciate your time yeah. and your insights. I, I and please, everybody, stay safe. <laughs> Amen. Good morning. Yep. Thank you, Josh. Peace. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. We Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>